I've titled this message tonight, The Seed of God. The Seed of God. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, 1 John 3, verse 1 and following. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knew us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear yet what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Praise the Lord. Saints, many people in the world live with an uncertainty of whether or not they are really born of God or whether they are really saved. And John is dealing with this in the emphasis that he places both John really and Paul when they had truly been saved, when they are truly a child of God, their life will reflect this fact. It will reflect it in two primary areas, and I want to look at those tonight. But notice again, 1 Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Those that he foreknew, he also predestined, in other words, it was God's will for all of eternity, that they would be conformed to the image of his Son. In other words, that we being the children of God, we would live and behave like the Son of God in how he lived and how he carried himself, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. There's a passage in Hebrews that talks about how the Lord would not be ashamed to call us his brethren. And saints, that's the type of way I want to live. The Lord would not be ashamed to say, yeah, that's Robert. He's one of my brethren. His father is the father in heaven. Our father is that father. And our behavior should imitate one another. Behold, again, verse 1 of 1 John 3, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. When we were in sin, we were not children of God. The scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were without Christ. We were alienated from the covenants of God. We were strangers without hope in the world. We were by nature children of wrath. But now we have been by the cross, by what Jesus did on the cross, he has called us sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. In other words, the world wasn't in agreement with Jesus and it is not in agreement with us. So if the world hates us, the world despises us, it is because it first despised him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? It does not appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone, that is to say, every man, every woman, every person that has this hope, saints, purifies themselves even as he is pure. We continually, saints, every day of our life, keep our garments clean from sin. In other words, Keep them from being spotted. And if we do sin, we confess our sin and we ask the Lord to cleanse us with his blood. See, that is the thing. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, that we may never sin. If we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But if we have this hope that one of these days I'm going to see Jesus, one of these days he's going to split the eastern sky, I'm going to be resurrected when we have that hope. We keep ourselves pure. We keep on purifying ourselves all the time. And saints, that's what our life should be. We shouldn't get careless. We shouldn't just live any old way. We should live as if we know the Lord is returning. And then verse four, whosoever commits sin. Now I need to show you something here that you don't see in the English translation, especially in the King James, is that it is not getting the tenses in the verb right, okay? It should read something like this. Whosoever continues to commit sin transgresses also 
the law. For sin is transgression of the law. For we know that he, who, that he was manifest, that is Jesus, to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not, again, does not go on sinning. That is the, not the pattern of their life. Whosoever sins, that in other words, there, that is the pattern of their life, has not seen him, neither do they know him. Those who were baptized into Christ and abide in him do not have a habit of disobeying God. Saints, when a person is doing that, they are not behaving like a person who is saved. They're behaving like a person who is lost. But when we have been born of God, it is not our nature to go on sinning. He has changed us. He's given us a new heart. He's given us a new spirit. He's given us a new desire. And our desire is to obey the Lord. This doesn't mean we can't be tempted. It doesn't mean we can't be tested. It doesn't mean that sometimes we might stumble. But what it does mean, it is not our nature to go on sinning. Notice the scripture says that if you do go on sinning, that you have not seen him, neither known him. And one of these days, people are going to stand before God. Jesus said it. Many on that day are going to say to me, Lord, Lord. In thy name have we not prophesied. In thy name have we not cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. But he said, I will say unto them, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You see, they never really knew the Lord. They, had, they moved in power, at least what they perceived to be power. And saints, this is something that is an awful misconception. Just because God uses a person does not mean anything about their salvation. Nothing at all. The Bible doesn't say you will know them by their gifts. It doesn't say you will know them by their talents. It doesn't say you'll know them by all the wonderful works they will do. It says you will know them by what? Their fruits. People go running after people just because miracles are happening. But saints, this is not where to look. And that's why so many on that day, again, are going to be deceived. Lord, we've done many wonderful works. It's acts of dunamis. In the Greek, that means supernatural works. It means things that can only be done with great power. But notice what he said here, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. This is a very commonsensical thing, isn't it? Don't let anyone deceive you, though, because people try to talk you out of it all the time. He that commits sin, in other words, this is the pattern of their life, is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see, a person's life reveals what father they have. You'll remember Jesus told the religious leaders, he says, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you will do. He didn't abide in the truth from the beginning. When he makes a lie, he, he speaks of himself, for he's the, a liar and the father of it. You see, this is the thing. And saints, we have to be born of God if we are to change. If we're not changed, we are not born of God. We need to be changed at that point. We need to be truly born again. Again, a person's life reveals what father they have. If they live in sin, they are still of their father, the devil. I don't care what they profess. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. In other words, they don't go on sinning. For his seed remains in him. It's interesting how I was looking at one of my grandsons the other day. and I snapped a picture. He was laying down. He had the blanket over his head just a certain way. And I had a flashback of my son Daniel when he was a little boy. I looked at him, I said, wow, that looks just like Daniel. And I took a picture, I sent it to Daniel. I said, look at this picture, he looks just like you. And saints, that's how it ought to be. We ought to be a chip off the old block. God ought to be able to look down and say, I see myself in her. I see myself in him, in his behavior, in her behavior. They're just like me. I see a resemblance of them in me. Whosoever, again, is born of God doesn't commit sin because his seed remains in him. And today we would say, it's not in your genes to do that anymore. 
It's not in your makeup. It's not in your genetic code, if you like, to behave that way anymore. And I realize our body needs to be redeemed. So there's a limit to this illustration that I'm giving you. You see, when we have the nature of God, we no longer have a nature to rebel. We have no longer have a nature to want to just sin for the sake of sinning and finding pleasure in sin just for sin's sake. I used to ask the young people, whenever they were in high school and things like that, I would ask them this question. I said, why do you think them kids go out back of the school and smoke? I asked them that. I said, well, I said, do you think it's because they enjoy choking? Do you think they enjoy doing it? And I would always think, I would see this. I remember my dad telling me, he's like, yeah, when I first started smoking, first time I spoke, it nearly choked me to death. Well, you say, well, why... Why did they continue to do it? Saints, I will tell you why. It's, it's because in our flesh, when we are lost, we have a desire to be gratified by rebellion itself. That's what it was. They were just being gratified by the rebellion. Anything they could do to rebel against authority, that's what they were doing. But what they didn't realize is the devil had a hook in that bait and he would capture them. And see, this is the thing. When we are born of God, He changes our nature so that we don't want to just rebel against the Lord anymore. Verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not do righteousness is not of God. Neither, here comes the second piece, he or she that does not love their brother. So the first piece of it, if we're truly been born of God, our desire is to obey God. Our desires to keep serving the Lord, do what is right in His eyes, is natural. But what is also natural is that we love one another. And saints, if you take away either one of these two, it simply does not work. For this is the message, verse 11, that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Notice this, we're going to see how these things kind of tie together. There is a relationship, saints, between righteousness and wanting to be righteous and love. There is also a relationship between wanting to be rebellious and hate. They go together. He's going to show us this right here. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And why did he slew him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's were righteous. You see, not only was there sin in his heart, there was hatred in his heart. And when he saw his brother, he looked at him with hate and he despised him and he ultimately killed him. Why? Because his own works, the scripture says, were evil. Notice again the connection between righteousness and love. Cain was unrighteous and Cain was unloving. They come together as a package. And saints, this is important to understand. Again, verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. The world's going to look at you the way Cain looked at Abel. This is the message. The world's going to look, look at you just like Cain looked at his brother Abel. When he looked at him, he didn't look and say, You know, I want to be just like my brother. He's such a great example. I wish I'd just patted myself after him. No. He looked at him and he despised him. And he hated him. And the scripture said he lured him off and he murdered his own brother in cold blood. And saints, this is the attitude of the devil living inside of Cain. And it was evident from the beginning. But verse 14, we know, this is what we know. This is Cain's experience. This is Cain's behavior. But we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. You see that? God is telling us right here. You want to know whether you've passed from death to life? Do you love your brothers and sisters in the Lord? Do you love people? Do you have a heart of love for them, especially people who know the Lord? Because if you don't, then you have not passed from death unto life. This is a primary test to know whether you and I have been born of God. One of the characteristics, of, one of the primary characteristics of God is that God is love. 
And he that knoweth, uh, loveth not, knoweth not God. Again, for God is love. Do we love our brothers? Do we love our sisters? This is a litmus test for whether or not we have passed from death to life. Verse 15, whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. Think of that. You don't have to actually kill them. All you have to do is hate them. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in them. You know, some people think they have a right to hate somebody. Well, you don't realize what they did to me, Brother Robert. Well, if you hate your brother, you hate your sister, you hate folks, then you have a serious, serious heart condition. Hereby perceive we, verse 16, the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You see, this is the exact opposite attitude. It isn't an attitude of hatred. It's an attitude of expressing our love towards others in any way that is needed or whatever is necessary. Even to the point, notice what he said, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Saints, is it in our heart to want to see other people help and other people lifted up? Is it in our heart to want to make sure that other folks, whenever they're sick or whether there's something wrong, that we can do whatever we can to lift them up, to encourage them, or to help them in whatever way that we can? See, this is the attitude that we should have. Not being selfish, but laying down our life, as it were, helping out and doing what we can. Not, again, in selfishness, but out of selflessness. Verse 17, he gives an example. Whosoever has this world's good, that is to say possessions, and sees his brother have a need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in them? Saints, sometimes people have genuine needs. They're not people that are just being lazy. They have real needs. And our heart should be to show compassion. If we shut up the bowels of compassion, this is something we can do. Then he says, how dwelleth the love of God in them? You see, there is a flow of love from the life of a person that has the seed of God in them. There is a flow of love. There is a flow of compassion that flows out of them when they are born of God. This flow is expressed in the words of bowels, okay? It's really a higher up idea. It's up near the heart. The Bible just kind of gives a location from where this feeling is. When you have compassion for somebody, it's like there's just this burning feeling that you want to help them or do what you can. But you can close this off. You can shut it off. You can harden yourself to that. You can shut off the flow as it were. Now I want to show you an example of this happening in the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians 6 verse 11, Paul has been writing to them and writing to them and writing to them. They are living in carnality. They are all very selfish in their behavior. And there's a lot of things that I could say along these lines. But 1 and 2 Corinthians was written to people that are carnal. They're living a carnal life. And they're even questioning Paul now, even though he led them to Christ, mind you. They are questioning him. They're acting like, well, we can just push him off to the side. And he's having to defend himself. But notice what is said here. Verse 11. O oh, you Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Here's what he's saying. We have thrown our heart open to you. We have shown you compassion. We are showing you love. In everything that I'm sharing with you, it is like we've thrown our heart open to show you our love. You are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own bowels. If you look at that again in the original saints, it's a picture of restricting the flow of love and compassion out of your life. He's saying, I threw my heart wide open to you. I threw, as it were, my, my heart wide open to you, but you have restricted. You've cut us off. And that's what you've done to us. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak unto you as children, be ye also enlarged. In other words, won't you open up your heart to us like we've opened our heart up to you? 
And saints, this is a characteristic of a child of God, a willingness just to open our heart, to be compassionate and to be loving. I could have went through a number of scriptures where the Bible talks about when one member in the body is suffering, the others suffer with it. When one rejoices, the others rejoice with it. Because there's a sense in which that we are all one. We are a unit. We are like a body. And saints, if my hand is hurting, I don't look down and say, what's your problem? Right? You don't do that. But see, when we do things like that, we behave that way. What are we doing? We're shutting off our compassion. And then John, again, he asks this question. If you do that, if you close up your bowels of compassion, how dwelleth the love of God? In you. In other words, you're drifting back into carnality. You're drifting back into that attitude of Cain, and you are drifting away from the Lord. But what did Paul say in Romans chapter 12, verse 10? And I'm going to close with these verses. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Saints, this is the attitude that we should have as Christians. What do we pray for? We pray for others. We pray for people's needs. But this is what we should do. Be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love. This is love on top of love on top of love. This is love when somebody, you know, it, sometimes it's difficult, it's challenging because everybody has different personalities. Have you noticed that? Amen. Everybody has different personalities. And sometimes, saints, it takes a lot of love and patience to get on with some people. It takes a while to get to know them. First, your first meeting of them, you may see them and say, wow, you know, I, I don't know about them. But then over time, you get to where you have a pretty good relationship with them when you get to know them. But you have to have the patience to get to know the person. And that's what love does. I remember a young man came into our work one time. I hadn't been saved maybe six months, if even that long, maybe three months. And I remember this guy came in, and we, we were in an automotive shop, and he was complaining. He was going all kind of crazy. He was talking to me, I guess, like he thought I was the manager. He was complaining, oh, this is my tire, this and this and that. And I want to talk to the manager. And he came back up and we're talking and it became known that he was a Christian. And when I heard that he was a Christian and I saw the way he was behaving, I was completely put off by his behavior. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I was put off by that behavior. I thought to myself, wow, you know. So he went away and I remember probably maybe three or four weeks later, I remember the boss telling me, he said, uh, he goes, uh, we got a new guy now. I said, oh, really? He's like, yeah, I hired him. And he's going to start tonight. And I'd like for you to train him. I was like, okay. He's like, uh, yeah, he'll be coming anytime. Guess who came rocking around the corner? You get three guesses. First two don't count. And you're going to work with him by yourself tonight. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, boy. Boy, this is going to be a test. It's going to be a hard night tonight, you know. But you know what? It's interesting, saints. When I began talking to him, it's like God broke down all these barriers and we became pretty good friends. But sometimes we just don't realize and we just don't know. Sometimes maybe people are having a bad day, but we got to give people time. We got to have time to get to know someone. Don't just write somebody off on your first impression, because if I'd have done that, I would have lost out on an opportunity to have a friend. But see, love doesn't do that. Love doesn't shut off its bowels. Love just throws his heart wide open and says, Lord, I'm going to love the way you love. Father, I just thank you tonight that you're such a loving God. What manner of love that you have bestowed upon us that we would be called the children of God.